actually a little awkward to, to follow the API evangelist uh, on stage. Um, I have a reputation as being someone who's fairly critical of technology, for, very critical of education technology. Um, so when your boyfriend gives a talk and then you come up on stage and you say sort of critical things about APIs, it's going to be a little awkward later. Um, but it, it's not necessarily a critique of APIs per se. Um, I think technology, as we know, is, as Kranzberg Law tells us, right, it's neither good nor bad nor neutral. I think that APIs are not the problem and they're not the solution. They're sort of a symptom. And I think they'll, they're going to reflect um, what's happening in politics, what's happening in business, what's happening in culture. As you know, Steve Kladnick always likes to remind us, we need to think about how power works, and APIs will probably follow power. Um, so my, my goal today with my talk is to, I think I want us to ask questions about what does it mean when we open APIs, what does it mean when we open data, and particularly in education, how is that harmful? not just how is it helpful. I think we're very good about giving the messages that more technology is always progress and it's always better. But I think we should stop and I think think more critically ab about the technologies that we, that we adopt, particularly in education. Do they recognize students as humans who have agency or do these technologies sort of, with our joys of automation, do they sort of want to script things more and more and reduce humans to numbers and algorithms? Um, I think when we adopt new technologies, we need to sort of move forward with an ethic of care, not just with profit and not just with sort of innovation for innovation's sake in mind. So that's sort of my talk in a nutshell. But there's this awful thing that happens when you're a speaker at a conference. You're asked to, um, to give a title of your talk long before you sort of even thought what the hell you're going to talk about. And I got an email from Medi last week that was like, oh, what are you going to talk about? And I'm like, I have no fucking clue. I mean, APIs, I guess. Um, and so I was like, oh, well, I want to, you know, I'm a, this is the first time I'm giving a talk at a technical conference and not at an education conference. And I'm in France, and I don't want to make some sort of allusion to something in my title that doesn't translate well. And I wanted to talk about sort of this the technology, sort of a mixed bag for education. And so instead, for some reason, I decided to go with the whole Sergio Leone um, reference, um, uh, which is weird because it's a Western, right, shot in Italy and in Spain. Um, the, the, the main three actors gave their lines in English, but then it was sort of dubbed into Italian when it was released in Italy. And then when it was released in the US, dubbed back into English. Um, so I'm not, sure, I'm not sure if I've sort of handled the translation question at all well. And then, because um, I am, as Ken knows, the world's worst procrastinator, um, last night when I started to <laughs> prepare my talk, I got really sidetracked with thinking about um, Clint Eastwood. And I thought, uh, is it possible to frame a whole talk about APIs around Clint Eastwood? Um, is it possible to come up with enough images from this wonderful film career? I think he's been in fi over 50 films, created over 30, to sort of deliver in the sort of you know running back commentary behind my talk something about about um, APIs. Um, and I thought for a minute maybe it is right because the fistful of dollars is certainly I think the approach that many people in education technology are taking right now. There's wild excitement about education technology. A lot of folks have. Um, are making a lot of money or thinking that they're going to make a lot of money. We're seeing more investment in education technology than we've seen. It's, um, it's more than tripled over the last, the last decade. And I thought, oh, I could actually maybe talk a little bit about Gran Torino, right? His movie where he's, um, he's a little bit like the man with no name character from The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, and he's a little bit like Dirty Harry. And there's this moment where he, you know, gets, he gets angry and he actually does say, get off my lawn. And I thought, oh, that's so perfect. That's just exactly the way in which the sort of incumbent players in education technology think about startups. And they're very reluctant to add APIs. Or it could be a metaphor for how teachers, some some teachers think about technology, which is sort of, you know, tech, the sort of ones who are very reluctant to allow cell phones in their classrooms. Or I thought, um, I could refer to Clint Eastwood's really horrifying appearance at the 2012 um, Republican 
um, convention where he did this sort of ad lib conversation with Obama, um, an empty chair. And I thought, oh, that's an interesting way to think about um, empty promises and the bullshit that we tell each other about technology always making things better. Um, or could it could perhaps be a way to talk about aging technology that is just so embarrassingly awful that someone needs to say, please, let's not ever, ever, ever use it again or ask Clint Eastwood to ad lib in public. I'm um, actually, one of Mitt Romney's, um, one of Mitt Romney's assistants actually threw up after they were so horrified by this particular incident. And I thought too, well, that's great because a lot of times I read TechCrunch and I want to throw up um, after thinking about how education, sorry, <laughs> how education technology is depicted there. So there's lots, lots of ways we could talk about that. Um, and then of course there's the under, underappreciated Any Which Way You Can, which is a sequel to Any Which Way But Loose. Um, and again, thinking about the ways in which I could probably talk about the number of fights that I get in on Twitter for people who don't like what I have to say about their learn to code startup. Um, of course, I'd be remiss if I did not reference Dirty Harry. But then at some point about midnight last night, I asked myself, you've got to ask yourself one question, can you fill a half hour talk with Clint Eastwood references? And I think the answer is no. <laughs> Sorry. So um, I did toy for a brief time in talking about other movies. Um, again, I thought if I went too far down the Hollywood walk of sort of memory uh, walk, Again, we would sort of have this risk of something being lost in translation, right? The difference between a quarter pounder with cheese and a royale with cheese, for example. So screw it, I said I'm just gonna scrap the movie reference entirely and just give the talk that I initially thought about um, in, terms of, in terms of APIs. Because I really do wanna talk about this idea of privacy, of ownership of data, and why APIs, again, have this sort of mixed, mixed relationship um, to, to moving things forward. So the, a personal story. A couple of years ago, my mom gave me a manila envelope full of all my educational records, she said. Um, it was actually her story of what would count as an educational record. She'd saved um, mostly report cards, certificates, all the things that said I was a wonderful, smart, good daughter, um, including this wonderful piece of art that I have actually no recollection of making, but apparently it won a ribbon. Um, again, nice, another Western tie in here, profile of, of some, some figure from Western history. I have no idea. Um, but I think that the manila envelope is a really interesting way, and it's sort of often made me think about how we handle our data, how we handle our, handled our, di our data in sort of a, an analog day and how we, how we handle it today. What happens now that more and more of our schoolwork is being born digital, right? Is there some sort of virtual equivalent to the manila envelope? Or, and this is what I, this is what I really fear, are we going to continue to use more and more technology in these apps, in websites, in learning management systems, where we only have temporary access to our data, where there's no long-term storage plan, there's no manila envelope. Once we sort of create our content, once we put our content in, um, can we get it out? Can we get it out in a format that's reusable by humans and I think too by machines. Of course, this is the promise of APIs, right? This is the promise. The APIs are, but they don't always fulfill those promises, not, not in meaningful ways and certainly not to the benefit, not to the benefit of students. Um, I think that the data that comes out isn't often in the student's control. And again, that's a reflection, not of APIs per se, but that's a reflection of the institution of school, which isn't something that's actually in under students' control. So another, another anecdote. Last summer, I met a young girl who was, whose school was part of a one-to-one -one iPad program. Um, the, the, the girl's family weren't particularly tech savvy. But at the beginning of the school year, they were offered the opportunity to buy the iPad um, that she was going to use for the school year. And they were like, 
why would, why would we want to buy an iPad? Um, it's expensive. They said, no, thank you. Um, but then uh, this story you know, begins to have the sound like an Apple PR thing. But at the end of the year, they were convinced that this was a really interesting device. The girl loved it. She had um, downloaded a bunch of apps. She'd created a bunch of drawings. And so they went to the school and they said, OK, actually, we've changed our mind. Can we buy the iPad now? And the school said, nope, sorry. Um, you only had the opportunity at the beginning of the year to buy the iPad. You need to give the iPad back. Um, and so, all, so the iPad went back to the school, and she had no record, really, of her sixth grade year. She had no computer at home. She had no iTunes account at home. There was no ability for her to sort of transfer her data to another, another device. Her data, her data was gone. No, no envelope. So, I mean, you know, as awesome, I think, as, as, as many folks seem to believe that iPads are and as technology will be in education, um, I think we have to think about what's happening to our data. Where are we going to store our data? And this is where it's sort of, this is a question for all of us, but where are we going to store our kids' data is one that I think tends to strike people in the heart um, a little bit more profoundly. And of course, this isn't just something that Apple does. This isn't, this isn't you know, it, Apple isn't the one bad player in a world full of education technology that um, actually loves data portability. Um, in fact, I think, and I think we have to think about where our data stores, not just for the course of a class, but for, you know, for, for all of posterity. Um, of course, posterity is a word that sounds a lot like posterous. That's probably actually where those clever fellows came up with it. And of course, you know, posterous was a microblogging platform that was acquired by Twitter and shut down. Um, and a lot of teachers had been using Twitter. Um, a lot of librarians or Twitter posterous um, for for their you know for their projects to store their students' writings, to store their students' photos and videos. And this, you know, this closure of tools, particularly free tools, which is something that everyone tells startups, make your tools free so teachers can use your tools. Um, the sort of closure of, of tools, I think, is something that happens quite a lot um, in general, but it certainly happens a lot in education. And you know, we are always asking for students to put their data, for, to put their content, to write their essays, to leave remarks in these tools that the students lose access to. Usually it's a learning management system or something like that. Schools are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to sort of with these platforms that the students don't actually have control, control over, their, over their data. I should give a shout out to the University of Mary Washington, which is, I think, one of the best examples of one of the most innovative um, efforts in education technology right now. They have a program called A Domain of One's Own. And the university buys the domain for every student. Um, they host it while the student's there. They teach the student how to run a LAMP stack. They show them how to use WordPress. And then the students use the, their domain for their digital portfolio. And then when the student graduates, ownership is transferred and the student has their own domain. They own their own data. It doesn't, it doesn't go away. I think you know the demise of the demise of Posterous and all of these tools. I think you know the number of startups that have hit the dead pool this year is is a testament. I think we should always ask, right? Are we storing our digital content, our education content in particular, in a place that we control, in a place that we own? Um, do we own our data, right? Who owns our data? Um, you know the Manila envelope that my mom had gave for me was in some ways, like a much better way for me to control my data. She was able to gather it all together and hand it over to me. I mean, analog is actually pretty awesome. Um, but in some ways, the papers that I have in my possession now, they aren't even, they aren't the original. They're the transcripts, right? A transcript just means it's a copy. The school still owns the original. Um, the, all the report cards, I mean, I guess someone owns the original. It's been decades now since I was in school, so perhaps, perhaps they're lost. Um, but it's a transcript, and I think if for those of us who've sort of asked, tried to get even a transcript out of a school before knows how challenging it is to get, to get a copy of your data. Um, they make you send money, and then often they send you a print piece, or if they think they're super savvy, they'll send you a PDF, which doesn't count as giving me my data at all. 
so the school retains your data. In the US, we have a thing called FERPA, the um, Family Education um, Rights and Privacy Act. And that law um, was actually um, uh, from 1974, so certainly, certainly uh, pre-iPad, the education pre-iPad era. Um, that, that sort of is supposed to protect student privacy, but it doesn't say anywhere in FERPA who owns student data. Right? It's not clear who owns student data. In some ways, the school sees themselves as a steward for student data, but schools make a lot of deals with education, um, with education software, and really the question of ownership is spelled out in the terms of service. Um, it, the, schools, the, the schools and the databases, that's where, that's where the, data, the data is owned. And I think that as we're sort of tracking on more and more data, before we ask this question about let's open up these databases, these proprietary ancient um, databases that schools have, I think it's worth thinking about what exactly is the student's educational record, right? Because it's, is it just their name, their dates of attendance, the courses that they've taken, maybe their test scores? Does it include their behavioral records? Does it include their attendance? Does it include the, their healthcare records? Um, what about all the data? that's now being tracked on students, right? Their search engine history, if they've used the search engine at school. Their Google Apps records, all the th things that they've done in the learning management system. Any time that they've blogged or made a comment on someone on a forum. The internet usage while on campus, what have they uploaded, what have they downloaded. Um, their social media profiles. Did they watch the Khan Academy video? How long did they spend on the Khan Academy site? When did they press pause? When did they press uh, rewind? Um, the exercises that they've completed, the number of clicks, the keystrokes, and the mouse clicks that are logged. This last piece, incidentally, is how Coursera says that they plan to identify and verify students' identities on their MOOC platform with a combination of biometric data and logging all the students' keystrokes. So, you know, do students own this data? When we talk about opening up this data with APIs, who are we opening it up to? What data? Do students, are students, do students control any of this data? Um, can they access it? Can they download it? Can they review it, right? Do they, are they even aware um, that this data is being collected about them? Are they asked their consent before it's shared? Um, these really aren't problems that the manila envelope had, of course. Um, that manila envelope was really about preservation and nostalgia, uh, good memories and bad memories and all the things that I had forgotten about being in third grade and really hating swimming class. Um, thankfully, my mother saved all those things for me. But that's her record of me. Um, but she did save it for me, and I'm, I'm very thankful that I, have, that I have that record. But nowadays, when we talk about students' records, we don't have to just worry about it all disappearing like Posterous did. I think we have to talk about not just maintaining it for the future, but what are our abilities to sort of review it and access it in real time? Again, so it's not just collecting it so that we can recollect, so that we can sort of recollect things. We're sort of collecting data so we can analyze it. And this is one of the hot new trends in education technology right now, this notion of, of learning analytics, right? What sort of insights will we be able to glean about students if we look at all of their data in real time, right? So can we tell sort of who, like, can we tell things about students' interests? Can we tell things about students' success? Are we gonna start doing predictive modeling? There's a lot of, I think, a very interesting and sort of troubling ethical concerns around this. Um, of course, there are lots of barriers. There are lots of barriers to schools doing learning analytics, largely because many of these systems still don't have APIs. Um, but I think that this sort of drive towards opening up access to data is being driven as a business, as being driven as a technology solution, but it's definitely not something that's being thought about in terms of what the students, what the students want. So again, I think it's asked, you know, who owns all this student data? Um, you know, we say it's, I think it's, we sort of talk about it a lot in, in technology circles, sort of glibly even now, that if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. But I've heard people talk about data as this sort of product a lot of times over the cut here at the last, in the last couple of days, as though there is something that we're going to extract, a value that we're going to mine or extract from other people. Um, and I think that, 
you know, I think that we need to th think about think about what that think about what that means. You know, companies have long, for a long time, have gathered data about us, um, about all of our transactions and our demographics, and now they're really starting to sift through this um, to improve a product, right? To improve the marketing, to beat their competition, uh, and I think that there's a sense, you know, like we said, that the data is the new oil. That our lives are about to be mined. Our children's lives are about to be mined, um, and I think we need to ask: How can we make sure that the value, that the value stays, stays with us? Um, I asked a couple of months ago on Twitter, you know, this question of who owns your education data, and lots of people responded, which I think uh, we saw in the, poli the the politics of API panel earlier. Lots of people shrugged and said, "Eh, it doesn't matter. Who cares? As long as they're not doing anything wrong with it, um, I don't really care who owns it." I think that that's a pretty common, a fairly common response. Um, you know, particularly when you're talking about other people's data, this notion that, eh, I don't know, if it's the government owns it or a software provider owns it or someone owns it, you know, as long as they're doing something to help students, right? That's, that's the promise, um, to, you know, to keep students in school, to, to help them finish college and so on. Um, I, I don't think, I don't want to argue that these aren't positive, but these aren't what students necessarily are aware of or thinking about. It's not what they would ask for themselves. And I think that if students don't own, all of us really, if we don't own our own data, right, if we don't control the data, then this is going to be something that's happening to us. This isn't something that we're going to be doing for students. We want to be able to do things for students. We want them to be able to do things for themselves. Otherwise, I think that technology is just something, something that we do, we do to students. Um, so I think if, we have to, if we're going to build a virtual version of that manila envelope and really put the control in the hands of parents and students, we have to think, we have to really think carefully about what personal content looks like what personal learning analytics look like. I think it has to demand how we change the way in which we build systems, change the way in which we think about the culture of school. And again, this isn't something that you can just say an API is going to fix this. An API isn't going to change the culture of school. Um, I think right now, as it stands, the benefit of all this data, the benefit of opening data, the benefit of opening APIs and technology, it's going to the software provider first. Maybe it's going to the school. And really, the person who creates this data, the student, tends really not to benefit. And I, I always have to insist that, you know, this is, when it comes to learning, this is their learning. This is their data. They should have some control over it, even if our policies and our laws don't fully recognize it. I think if, they don't recognize it now, I think that they might. I don't think that we can say that that's the sort of inevitability that we'll all give up control of our data. It's not inevitable that we all give up privacy. Things change, culture changes. Um, and so I think, you know, as we press forward with new technologies, when we open up APIs, when we add data to software and systems, I do want us to think about sort of how can we keep the good in mind, right? And who is the good for? Who's benefiting? This can't just be what's good for engineers. Sorry. It can't just be what's good for entrepreneurs. Sorry. It has to be good for users. It has to be good for the public. It has to be good as they define it, not good as sort of has implemented in a sort of top-down decision that we've decided what's good for you. I think as it currently stands, we have such powerful institutions that are playing, playing in the technology sector, Silicon Valley schools in the case of education technology, and even you know, these sort of st massive stories that we tell out of, out of Hollywood. I think that on close inspection, there's a lot of bad and ugly, and I don't think we do anyone any service by only focusing on a certain shiny, sunny story of of sort of rebel heroes, I think we have to ask some really difficult questions about what's happening with technology. I think we have to be a lot more critical about this future that we're building. So thank you. Well, any any question? <clears throat> I'm sorry, it may go, <laughs> you make me uh, well. 
who works in an education field there? Nobody, so it's a good <laughs> audience. No, why not, why not, why not? But I, I may have, a, I may have a, a question for you. You know, the, the last year, the eight, oh, you have a question, Alex? Yeah. 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 Sorry. So where is all that? So all the data is going to the education software companies, and they're then using that to market back to the students. Are there any, are there any other examples of where the, eight, where, where the APIs are actually more in control of the of the educators, and the educators can determine how, where the you know what content is presented, and you know where that in providing some kind of stewardship of that data itself. So the you know so theoretically, a student or a student's parent could access that. No, and I think that, I mean I think that this is the challenge. I think that on one hand you have a company like Newton, who's um, they're one of the leaders in the learning analytics um, and adaptive learning is the, are the buzzwords that what they would use. And so they say that they have you know tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of students that use their software. Um, they're ca they're gathering millions of data points. They say on each student. Um, who uses their math software, it, it integrates with, with Pearson in order to deliver them um, lessons that are sort of purportedly geared towards their specific skill and content level. So, so Newton is gathering, you know, millions of data points on each student. And on one hand, they say, well, that makes the, surf, the software more personalized. Um, but then on the other hand, really, it's making Newton um, quite a lucrative business that the students, I don't think the students are necessarily aware of how they're sort of, they're, they're sort of part of this other um, building out the adaptive, the, the machine learning and the adaptive engine that, that, Newton, that Newton profits handily on. On the other hand, there are lots of examples where I do think that opening up APIs and opening up data is, um, is really powerful. And I think it does wrest the control out of the hands of people who have kept things black boxed for a long time. Um, there was a, something just released uh, yesterday, um, uh, data about how much universities in the US spend, has spent in, since 2005 on athletics versus how much they've spent on academics. And you could map and see sort of where the, where, where the dollars are going, um, where the university is spending their money. It's all going in education. It's all, all of it. Oh. It's, yeah, especially University of Oregon, you could just see no more money spent on football. Um, but I think that those are the signs of things that do, I think, help us make better decisions around, around education. But I think for the most part, I think we really are, there's so much hype around the insights that people are going to be able to glean from handing over our data, building better recommendation engines, um, having education be much more like Netflix, where, you know, I see that you uh, watched Algebra 2, would you might want to consider, you know, history of, you know, I mean, if it's like that Netflix recommendation engine, we're, we're screwed, because um, that's lousy. But, um, but I, I do think that there are, that there are certainly cases where, where the value isn't necessary, where, you know, opening data does, you know, does sort of shed more light on a closed system. But I think a lot of cases, particularly with the sort of boom in education software right now, it's, it's much more about mining and extracting value than it is sort of building capable humans. Hi. Uh, from your point of view, who should be the one that should be uh, defending the students' uh, property on data? Should it be the institutions, the administration, the universities themselves? Uh, Enterprise themselves should be should have some kind of uh, public control on on providing the data back to the students. Who, who should be the ones? Everyone? Uh... I mean, I, I would say that on one hand, that the I mean, this the we have to do a lot more to make people think aware aware of this. I do think that that the institutions, the education institutions, have a responsibility as the stewards of of young minds and young bodies and young data as well. I think that they should do a lot better role. I'm not sure that, um, I'm not sure that university or school administrators necessarily have a great track record of that. Um, I would hope that, I hope that certain other professions that historically have done a much better job helping us think through and defend privacy would have a loud role. And one of those is definitely libraries. Um, and the, the library, 
um, librarians have, I think, for a long time been at the, both at the leading edge of thinking about technology adoption, but have also been very good about thinking about how the, the relationship that you have with the library is sort of a protected, a protected relationship. So I'm, I'm hoping that, I do think that there are some, some voices within, the, within institutions that can sort of be, be better at articulating why privacy, why privacy matters, um, who, should, who, should sort of, who should be responsible for this. I mean, I think it's the school, but. Thank you, Audrey, for uh, this talk. Uh, thank you very much. Wow. Mm -hmm.